the dot product. We're going to be looking at one way in which we can multiply vectors together. We actually have two different ways that we can do this. One is called the dot product, which of course we're talking about today, and then the other one is called the cross product. Okay, I want to make sure that this is not mistaken for multiplying vectors by a scalar value. That was a little bit different if you just took maybe the component form of a vector, multiplied it by some number, which would have just had you distribute that in. Okay, this is different. What we we're going to be doing is multiplying two vectors together. And again, there's two types. We've got the dot product and also the cross product, but today we're going to be looking at the dot product. Overall, this is a very complicated idea. But what we're going to do to start things off is to look at vectors in certain directions and think about the result that we would get by multiplying vectors in those particular directions. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about parallel vectors. Parallel vectors are vectors that would be contained in parallel lines. Okay, so just imagine on the coordinate grid that you had a couple parallel lines. If those vectors sit on top of the parallel lines, those vectors would be parallel to each other. All right, so we're going to begin here with this prompt. If vector 1 is parallel to vector 2, then vector 2 is going to be equal to k times vector 1, where k is some real number. So what does that really mean here? k is just a scalar value. And if we think back to when we did things with component form, what we did is we just distributed that number into the vector. And ultimately, all it did is it changed the magnitude of the vector. And remember that vectors are defined by two things, the direction and the magnitude. So if you got two vectors that are parallel, they already have that same direction. The only difference that could be there is the magnitude of it. So this statement would hold true. These vectors would be equal to each other with the difference of some multiplication that would be involved. Okay, and then k could be something greater than one to make sure that this vector turns out to be the same size as v2, or k could be a value that's less than one, which would shrink it down to match the size of this one. All right, the other types of vectors that we want to look at here to get everything rolling are going to be perpendicular vectors. Two vectors contained in perpendicular lines will be perpendicular vectors, because that really just refers to their direction that you have there. All right, so let's start with this statement here. If vector one is perpendicular to vector two, then y1 over x1 multiplied by y2 over x2 is going to equal negative 1. Now that might not actually sound too familiar, but what we're referring to here is the slopes of the vectors. Be thinking that these are the component forms for each of the two vectors. So vector 1 has a horizontal component of x1, it has a vertical component of y1. And if we look at those changes, because the components are really just changes here. If you take the change in the y value divided by the change in the x value, that would just be the slope. So same thing over here for vector two. All right, so recall from previous subjects that if two lines are perpendicular, their slopes are gonna be opposite reciprocals. For example, if one of my lines had a slope of a over b, the other, the perpendicular slope to that one is gonna be negative b over a. They're going to be reciprocals, and one's going to be positive, one's going to be negative, so they'd be opposites. And if I took these two things together and I multiplied them, so if I take A over B and multiply that by negative B over A, the Bs are going to cancel as a 1, the As are going to cancel as a 1, which is going to give us 1, got ahead of myself there, which is going to give you 1, but because one is positive and one is negative, the result will be negative one. And that's what this basically tells us here. If you take the slope of vector one and multiply it by the slope of vector two, the result would be negative one. We don't generally talk about that with perpendicular lines and slopes, but it's true based off of that opposite reciprocal. And that's gonna lead us to this, which is gonna be really useful for what we call our dot product. Now to get from here to there, we're just gonna generally do some algebra. We'll go ahead and multiply the y values. So you're gonna get y1, y2. You're gonna multiply the x values. You're gonna get x1, x2, just together. So we really just push them together. This is gonna be equal to negative one. And of course, all of this is true because the vectors are perpendicular. All right, now, what I'm gonna do is multiply that denominator over to the negative one, which is gonna give me, let's see, we'll have y1, y2 is equal to negative x1, x2. And with one more step, we can take this and just move it to the other side through addition. 
and we get x1 times x2 plus y1 times y2 is equal to 0. And what's sort of neat about this is if you remember that these, yes, do represent the slope, but they also represent the components to the vectors. So what we've really figured out here is that for perpendicular vectors, if you take the product of their x components and you add that to the product of the y components, the result will be zero. I'll restate that again. For perpendicular vectors, if you take the product of the x components and you add it to the product of the y components, you will always get zero. All right, for example number one, we're given three vectors, u, v, and w, and asked to verify that v and w are parallel. Okay, we don't need to prove that all of them are parallel, just that v and w will be parallel. All right, so vector v is gonna have the components for two. Vector w has the components negative 12, negative six. All right, so we actually have two different ways we can verify this. The first would be to look for a scale factor. We can simply look at our x values. We can look at the four and the negative 12 and see if we can identify a number that we'd be able to multiply four by to get negative 12. And of course, that would be negative three. We could multiply by negative three. And that holds true for the y components. You can multiply two by negative three and also get negative six. That means that we do have a k value or a scalar value, so the two vectors are gonna be parallel to each other. The second method though that we could use for this is to treat them sort of like slopes because your component form, your component form is essentially a slope. You're gonna be moving to the right four, up two. So the slope of vector v is gonna be two over four, which is the same thing as one half. The slope of vector w is gonna be negative six over negative 12, which of course is also one half. So being that those are equal to each other, you would have the same direction, which means you have the same slope, which means that they would run in parallel lines. Okay, for example two, we're gonna show that both V and W, which happen to be parallel to each other, we're gonna show that V and W are perpendicular to U. So we'll just do them separately here. Okay, so first let's check this one out. V perpendicular to U verify that that's true. All right, so the way that we're gonna do that is to use our new equation, which said that if vectors are perpendicular, then the product of their x components plus the product of their y components is gonna equal zero. So all we need to do is take the numbers, get them into those spots and see that it does in fact come out to be zero. All right, so v and u, let's make sure I don't mix these up. The x's will be the four and the three so we're gonna have four times three. Again, from V, that's the four. From U, that's the three, and those are the X components. We're gonna add that to the Y component of V, which is two, multiplied by the Y component of U, which is negative six. Okay, and if you look at this, you're gonna get a 12 plus negative 12 so it does in fact equal zero, which will mean that these two vectors are perpendicular to each other. Now, of course, if V is parallel to W and V is perpendicular to U, then logically W is gonna be perpendicular to U. But we'll go ahead and uh, write that one up as well. It's good practice. All right, so same template here. Let's see, we've already got used components. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna steal those. We got the three and the negative six. Okay, just coming from here. Now W, we've got negative 12, we've got negative six. Negative 12 times three is gonna give you negative 36. Negative six times negative six gives you positive 36 which does become zero and those are perpendicular. All right, so the last calculation that we did, which we used to verify that two vectors were perpendicular, the product of the X's plus the product of the Y's, occurs surprisingly very often when we're working with vectors. So often that we've decided to call this the dot product. 
In other words, the dot product is going to be taking two vectors in component form, multiplying their x components, multiplying their y components, and then adding them together. The end result of that, to be really clear here, the end result is not going to be a vector, but it is going to be a scalar quantity. It turns out to just be a number, like in our last calculation, to demonstrate that the vectors were perpendicular, the answer was zero. It wasn't a vector. It did not have a direction and a magnitude. It was just simply a number, which we refer to as a scalar quantity. Listed here are some properties that the dot product does have. U dot V, so that'll be our indication that we want to do this calculation here. U dot V is going to be equal to V dot U. We have a commutative property. The order in which you have your vectors doesn't really matter. And I think if you look back at the calculations here, it wouldn't matter if you had x1 before or after x2. The result would be the same thing. So we have a commutative property. All right, the next property we have is that if you were to take the dot product of a vector in itself, the result of that is actually going to be equivalent to the magnitude of that vector raised to the second power. Our third property is going to look at multiplying a scalar value by a dot product. And for this, you do need to be a little bit careful because sometimes when we see a value on the outside of parentheses, we want to distribute it into everything that is in the parentheses. However, this is multiplication, and like in general algebra, if you have two things that are being multiplied, you can't distribute across multiplication. You do distribute across addition, which is what you're going to see in the next one. Okay, so in this case, what you do is you multiply the scalar value by either vector u or vector v. Over here, it shows it multiplied by vector u, then after that, you would do the dot product. But technically, we do have a commutative property, which would mean that you can multiply the k value by the v, then do the dot product if you want. You could basically switch the order that you see here. All right, going back to the last one here, you can distribute across addition. Okay, so if you're gonna be taking a dot product, which is multiplication, if you're gonna be taking a dot product between a vector and the sum of two other vectors, you can distribute that dot product to V and to W, which would give you this. All right, so I have one more property to look at using dot products. You can actually figure out the angle between two vectors, which we're gonna call theta here. You can figure out the angle between two vectors using this equation. The cosine of the angle between the vectors is gonna be equal to the dot product of the vectors divided by the product of the magnitudes. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at that here. We've got a couple of vectors in component form. This is gonna to go to the right one and up two. This is gonna to go to the left three and then up one. Let's, let's go ahead and plot the first one here. So I'll make sure I got enough room for this. All right, so that'll be the first vector that is over one, up two. The second vector, what we're gonna do is actually set them up uh, tail to tail, that'll look nice here. All right, negative three and a one. That's going to get you here. All right, so for this picture, you don't want them to be tip to tail because we're not adding the vectors. What we're looking at are two vectors that are just moving in certain directions. And if you remove them together in some way so that they do cross each other, which I just set up as tail to tail, they would create some sort of an angle that would be there. So this would be the easier position for this. All right, so our calculation says this. The cosine of the angle, which is what we're going to be figuring out here, that's this guy right there. That is going to be equal to the dot product of the vectors divided by the magnitude of the vectors. All right, so for the dot product, what we're going to do is take the product of our x's, okay, so that would be 1 and negative 3, which is going to give you negative 3, plus the product of our y's, which is going to give us 2. We'll divide that by the product of the magnitudes. That will require a little bit of Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so off to the side here. We've got one squared plus two squared, which is gonna equal five. So that would be the square root of five then. Then from this vector, we've got, we've got three squared plus one squared, which is gonna give us 10. So the magnitude is gonna be the square root of 10. All right, this I can clean up a little bit here. I can go ahead and add that together, which would give me negative one. Then at the bottom, the product of the radicals is actually just the uh, square root of the radicands, which is gonna give you square root of 50. All right, so that's this whole side worked out. 
that would be equal to the cosine of theta. So to complete the problem, what we'll do is take an arc cosine of this. All right, so you're gonna to need to make sure you are in degrees for this. Okay, so I'm set for degrees. I'm gonna take the arc cosine of negative one divided by the square root of 50, and that will give me 98, actually it's not equal to that because I did an arc cosine. So theta is gonna be equal to 98.13 degrees. All right, so one last thing here, just to verify that this actually worked out, because we did have a diagram here, I should be able to measure that angle and see that it is 98.13 degrees. Well, with a limitation that we'll probably get around like 98, 99 degrees. All right, what I'm gonna do here so I get a good measurement is uh, go ahead and just extend these out. That's just for the purpose of my protractor. Okay. So we go ahead and center that right there. All right, we're on that line, and if you follow this up, you're gonna notice that we're right there at 98 degrees. Wait there, boy. All right, so let's see this work out. Ooh, would've got me right there. 